Ephesians chapter 6. These are the verses that we spent the past eight weeks looking at. Finally, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God. So that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities and against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces and the, of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God. So that when the day will come, when the day, when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, with your feet fitted with, with, with readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to this, take up the shield of faith, which can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. George here is looking pretty snazzy, isn't he? He's coming off a long way in these eight weeks. He's been given a, a knowledge of who his enemy is. He's been given some knee pads to represent the fact that his life is going to have to be bathed in prayer. He's been given truth. He's been given a breastplate made of righteousness. He's been given some shoes to make him ready for battle. He's been given a sword made of the word of God. And you know what? I think he looks pretty good at this point, but there's something missing, isn't it? Something's just not quite right. Well, if you didn't recognize that character from the clip, his name is Captain America. Maybe you didn't recognize him with his red, white, and blue fancy spandex suit not on him. And... Well, Captain America, well, he's one of the original superheroes. He actually goes all the way back to, to World War II. So he's been around quite a while. He's a man that ages very well. But you know what? Um, at one point in his life, he was this scrawny little runt. But he was given a serum. A serum that well, gave him some superpowers. It made him bigger. It made him faster. It made him stronger. It gave him the ability to heal quickly so he could take more punishment. But in spite of all of those powers, you know what Captain America is best known for? Shield. The shield. And that is what our friend George right now is missing. He is missing his shield. See, it's that last piece of armor as he's headed off to battle that George is supposed to pick up. George is preparing himself for a commitment, and this shield is very important. Now again, Captain America is cool, but let's not forget Paul's model when he's sitting here writing these scriptures, what he's looking at. He's looking at a Roman soldier. And as he's looking at that Roman soldier, and that Roman soldier sitting there, I got a feeling laying somewhere near the soldier was probably this shield. Even though he was on duty just keeping watch over Paul. I got a feeling that shield wasn't far away in case battle was to come. I'll tell you a little bit about that Roman shield because it's quite amazing. The average Roman shield they say was 22 pounds. So that is the shield that they carried into battle. It was a large rectangular shield, except for it had a curve. They would soak the wood that they made these things out of, and it did have a wood backing, and then they would put over top of it, and they would gradually bow that wood, and then they would put the, the metal and the other things around it until they got the shield, but it would have a bow around it. It wasn't just this flat shield that was there. It was made from three sheets of wood glued together, covered with canvas and leather. That's how they made them. It was then soaked. Once they put the shield together, they would soak that shield into water so that all that leather and all that wood would absorb all of the water. It was large in height and width to cover the entire wilder, making it very unlikely for him to get hit by missile fire. The metal protrusion that you see right in the middle, well, it was made as an auxiliary punching device. So the weapon could also, could also be used as a weapon in hand-to-hand -hand combat. 
This shield was important. In fact, as many Roman soldiers got together, they could get together standing shoulder to shoulder, side by side, and they could put the shields right up next to each other. And then some of the people could come behind them and hold shields. So they could actually build themselves a little hut out of these shields so that when they went into battle, they were all protected. See, in spite of how good all of the other armor is, let's face it, there's always kinks, isn't it? There's always little gaps and little separations and places that don't quite fit. And when you turn, maybe something just isn't as covered. That's the job of the shield. It's to cover up anything that may be open because the shield is one solid piece that you hold. Paul calls our shield a shield of faith. Now we've talked a whole bunch about faith. And when we start next year, we're going to talk a whole bunch more about what faith looks like because faith is important. And I think the fact that Paul calls it a faith shield says a lot to us because faith is where this all begins. All of this armor only works if you have faith in God. All of the armor only combines together to protect you if faith goes with you. If you do not have faith, then you know what? You can keep putting on God's righteousness, and you can think you've got a helmet of salvation, and you can even learn all of God's words you want. You can make yourself ready. You can pray. You can study about Satan. But if you don't have faith, then it's going to all be for naught. And the thing that you need to know is, well, your faith... It's going to be under fire. In addition to all these things, take up the shield of faith, which you can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. You know why they soaked those shields in water before they gave them to Roman soldiers? So that when they flung an arrow at them, it was lit on fire and it hit them, the wood and the canvas and the leather and all the materials that it was made from wouldn't catch on fire. After all, what good would a shield be if it was just something that would easily catch on fire and burn up? So you need to understand your faith that you have, it's going to be under fire. And you better know whose arrows they are. This ties all the way back to that beginning sermon that we did when we started this series about who the enemy is, who the nemesis is, who's the person that is out there is Satan. It says he's going to light these arrows and go flinging them into my life. And I want to tell you something. Sometimes I see them. I really do. Now, not literally. I want to tell you, I don't have visions of flaming air. Sometimes it feels like it, though. But, but I see them. It stands off in the distance. Isn't it interesting that we are given a sword of the spirit, which is a hand-to-hand -hand combat weapon. Satan is giving flaming arrows that he can stand back at a safe distance from us and launch them into my life. And the little flames just seem to hit and fire begins to go and panic begins to start. And while these are Satan's arrows, he understands whose ultimate purpose it is. And sometimes this bothers me. While they are Satan's arrows, they're God's purpose. Remember in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, when Joseph meets his brothers back after he sold him into slavery? This is what he said to them. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. See, sometimes Satan is hurling those arrows and the means to destroy us, but, but God has a bigger plan. God has something else in mind. Romans chapter 8, 28, we're familiar with these verses. These are verses that we love to hear. And we know that all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. That means those arrows that Satan is flinging into your life, well, Satan's intending to destroy you, but God's intending to work it for your good. And that's troublesome. It is. Because God, why don't you just, just let me be? Lord, I'll follow you. Don't make this so complicated. Don't make this so hard. Well, Paul promises us in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses, verse 13, that our faith is going to be tested. The work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to that light. It will be revealed with fire and with the fire will test the quality of each person's work. You see, eventually there's going to be another testing of your faith. 
And it's going to be done with fire. Now, I don't know that this is literally fire like we're talking. I think Paul is using a metaphor here to kind of help us to understand how things tested. Because you understand when something is tested by fire, well, it can have two outcomes, can't it? There are two things that can happen when you set something on fire. The first thing, I can attest to this, I've seen it live in action, fire can destroy. That's what it says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear and will roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything, that, everything done in it will be laid to bare. Fire destroys things that aren't prepared for it. If you ever, if you ever go out camping and you start a fire, you can't just let it go and go and go because if you do, it will burn up everything that's in it. It will consume it all. So the fire will eventually go out unless it finds what? Something else to burn. And when you put something else into it, it will consume. We mentioned about the, the forest fires going on in California and the thousands upon thousands of acres that have just been ravaged and destroyed. Have you seen the pictures? That's what fire does. Left out of control, fire can consume everything it touches, or can it? There are some things that fire can't destroy. There are. There are some elements out there that are around that fire can do no damage to. As a matter of fact, when fire is pressed to those elements, those elements don't get destroyed, they become refined. 1 Peter chapter 1, 7 says, These have come so that they prove, they prove the genuineness of your faith, of the greater worth and goal, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. If you put fire to, to gold, what happens is the, the other things that are in the gold, gold is such a heavy metal when it becomes heated, the gold sinks and all the other stuff comes to the top. And so the people that work with gold, the people that are the metal just people, and they, they skim it off and they eventually just drain it all down. And you know what they get at the bottom? Pure gold. And the more you turn up the heat and the more fire you put on the gold, the purer it becomes. It refines itself through heat. So I want to ask you something. Your faith, which one is it? When the pressure is turned up and the heat is applied and things aren't going very well, does your faith get destroyed because it catches on fire? Or does your faith become refined because it is resistant to fire. See, because fire is going to come. You're not going to live in this world of scale. It's just not going to happen. And whether your faith becomes resistant or consumed all depends on, well, this idea. Satan's intent is to kill, steal, and destroy. God's desire is to rescue, restore, and refine. So who are you following? Are you allowing the struggles and the trials and the tribulations and all the things that are going on in your life? Are they you allowing them to kill, steal, and destroy you? Are you allowing them to pull you close to God and rescue, restore, and refine you? Change you? That's what faith is for. That's its design. And so this morning I want to start out by just answering three little questions about faith. Three important questions about faith. And the first question is, is what is your shield made of? What is it that you have constructed your shield of faith from? Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 says, Now faith is the confidence of what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. So scripture says that our faith is made of two things. Hope and assurance. There are two pieces of our life that have to press together to make faith work. These words are hope and assurance. Now, what exactly does that mean? What am I placing my hope in? Well, that's an easy answer. The easy answer is because of Jesus. 
We are placing our hope in Christ. This is what 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3-5 through 5 says. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. These are important verses because in Christ we have hope because of His mercy. No longer do I have to worry about the bad things in my life taking me down because God says He's going to have mercy on us. God says we're not going to go down if we stay with Him. It doesn't always mean it's going to be comfortable. It doesn't always mean it's not going to get a little hot. It doesn't mean the battle isn't going to be tough. But in the end, God's mercy will prevail over everything. That's something to place some hope in, isn't it? I have hope because I was given a new birth. I was given a, a second birth. Jesus talks about this to Nicodemus. Nicodemus comes in, he's trying to understand who Jesus is, and Jesus simply tells him, hey, Nicodemus, you've got to be born again. And Nicodemus is like, I'm confused. I can't go back and do that. That was a one-time event. My mom's not willing to help me again. And, he's, and he quickly tells, Jesus tells Nicodemus, you understand, I'm talking about a new birth. A new birth that's a restored relationship with Christ. You're able to stand there. And because of that new birth, I, I get a new life. Things don't go the way that they used to go for me. At least not if I'm living behind my shield of faith. If I've allowed that shield to be crafted from hope and assurance, then that means I'm living a new life that has some new hope, some new things. I'm not just putting my faith and trust in what I can accomplish. I'm putting my faith and trust in what Jesus accomplished on the cross. You see, when I say I have hope, it isn't a wishful thinking kind of hope. I'm not closing my eyes and saying, oh please, I hope I make it to heaven. Oh please, I hope I make it through this. Hope is not wishful thinking. Hope is an understanding that what is out there is there. If I just press toward it, it will be there when I get there. That's hope. If hope is just wishful thinking, that's not really hope because it will drag you down. Hope is understanding there is a madness out there, and if I just stay in the fight, I'm willing to get what I hope for. Dad, when I rented this movie, see, little rabbit trail here, called Unbroken, that we watched this weekend, and it skipped some because the disc has some damages, but it's okay, we got the point. This guy had been through so much, and at the end of it, they all had the point. If I can take it, I can make it. If I can get through it, I can, I can win the victory. How did he win the war? He stayed alive until it was over. And sometimes that's exactly what hope is. But hope is not just the only piece of our faith. There is this idea of assurance. Assurances are promises. When you invest money with people and you invest money with the bank, what's one of the first questions that you ask them? What is my return on investment? What's the interest rate I'm going to give? What are you going to give me if I give you? That's what we ask the bank. And, and you understand, God, God has some insurances. He has some return on investment for your life. According to 1 Peter, we get an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. The things that God is putting in our life are eternal. They're not just there today and gone tomorrow. God says, when I'm putting into your life, it's forever. It won't go away. It's not going to go bad. You're not going to open up the refrigerator one day and find God's promises covered with mold. It just doesn't work that way. God says, I'm going to be there forever with you. He's going to give us the hell that's not exactly for the here and now, but for eternity. We look at some of the things in our life and we want to know where is the here and now. Well, you have to understand, God's not a here and now kind of person. I pray for a lot of here and now kind of things. I pray for a lot of relief in my life. God, can you just take care of this and we'll be okay? God's not a here and now kind of God. God's looking at the great big picture out there at all the pieces and all the parts of my life that, Barry, I've got to take you through this 
so that we can build you up because there's something coming down the road that's going to be bigger than that. And you know what the thing is? If he stepped back for a moment and let me see the bigger than that, then I would be even more afraid, wouldn't I? So sometimes God has to open over here and now with an understanding that I've got an eternal vision for your life. I've got an eternal plan for your life. I don't want to just make you comfortable today. We don't might have to have a little tough time right now because down the road, the lessons that you learn in this tough time, they're going to be useful for the ministries I have for you to do later. I've seen it happen in my own life so many times. Things that happened in my life that I didn't understand, God said, you know what? You don't understand it now. Wait a few years. You'll figure it out. And I've used some of those, that armor, that faith that God gave me during those troublesome times, and when you have to do ministry, you can get up for one more round. That's the assurance he gives us. He tells us that he's going to give us the power to live. I don't have to look for a reason to get up in the morning. I don't have to look for a purpose for my life because God says, I've given you that. I have given you the power that you need to live. And ultimately, he gives us the salvation. Ultimately, in the middle of all of that fire that Satan is raining down on us, ultimately what is going to happen is this life is going to end. At some point, in some place, unless Jesus comes back before then, this life for me is going to end. And at some point, they're going to hopefully be standing over a casket saying nice things about me. Maybe not. Maybe they're just one of those funerals that nobody, nobody has anything nice to say. I don't know. But at some point, I am going to leave this planet. And all of the testing and the fire and the trials and the tribulations, they're going to be done because I have salvation waiting for me in where I'm going where there is no more trials and tribulations. You see, that's the assurance that you've been given. You're not living your life for this life. You're living your life for the life to come. It's the eternal perspective. And when I get that perspective, somehow those darts... They seem to come better into focus, don't you? They just kind of get there. Because you see, it all hinges on us using our shield through faith that Christ is who he says he is and God will do what he says he's going to do. That's your shield of faith. So that's what it's made of. The second question I want to explore is, is does size matter? We like the scripture, don't we? We, we write the scripture in Matthew chapter 17, verse 20. He replied, because you have so little faith, I tell you, if you have the faith as small as a mustard seed, you can, you can say to the mountain, move from here to there and it, will be, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. And we love this verse because we like to quote it and say, God is telling me I just got to have a little bit of faith. That's not what Jesus is saying here. We think that verse, I mean, we want to put things out there, but that's not what God, what Jesus is saying. Jesus is scolding people at this point. Jesus come along to the disciples, and they, he's, they don't have enough faith to do things. And he says, hey, guys, even if you had a little bit of faith, just a minuscule little bit of faith, you could do what you're trying to do and so much more. But then he goes on to say, but you don't even have enough faith to do that. It isn't the only time he's done this. He did the same thing in Matthew chapter 6, verse 30. Matthew chapter 8, verse 26. Matthew chapter 14, verse 31. Matthew chapter 16, verse 8. Jesus was constantly after the disciples, O ye of little faith. See, God never promotes that we have little faith. I, I, I didn't want to use the Captain America clip. I had this really cool this really cool object lesson I wanted to do. I wanted to get a volunteer to come up here with a little shield and a big shield, and we were going to shoot arrows at them. But I couldn't, I couldn't find any volunteers that would let me just shoot arrows at them. So, so I, I, I kind of scrapped that object lesson. But you understand, would you rather get up on a stage with a little bitty shield trying to stop an arrow or a great big shield? Now, I don't know about you. But I'll take the big shield, one that I can get all the way behind. And somehow we've got the idea that God is okay with little bitty faith. No, he's not. He's not at all. He wants great faith. This is what he says in Matthew chapter 8, verse 10. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, Truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. 
Whenever Jesus saw great faith, he pointed it out and said, See, that's what it's supposed to look like. See, that's what your shield is supposed to be. It's supposed to be great. It's supposed to be big. He did it again in Matthew chapter 15, verse 28. Then Jesus said to her, Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted, and, your, and her daughter was healed from that very moment. This woman came seeking Jesus, and he, she said, You know what? Just give me the crumbs, Jesus. Just give me the leftovers of what's there, and I'll put my faith in that. And Jesus said, I've never seen it before. This is what faith is supposed to look like. It's supposed to be great. It's supposed to stand out. It's supposed to be the shield that covers our life. It's supposed to be growing faith. Did you know faith grows? If your faith is the same size today as it was yesterday, as, as it was 10 years ago, you need to check your faith because faith grows. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 15 says, Neither do we go beyond our limits by boasting of work done by others. Our hope is that your faith continues to grow. Our sphere of activity among you will greatly expand. You see, this idea is, is that as you begin to get older and you become more seasoned in Christ, your faith begins to grow. It becomes bigger. It's out there. You know why it's growing? Because you are. I mean, Aubrey and Aaliyah don't need as big a shield as me, right? I've got more territory to cover. I've gotten bigger. But my life in general has gotten bigger because I've gone from being just myself to I have myself and I have a wife and I have kids and I have relationships that look at me and they all know that I'm a Christian and I have all of these things. I have, and so my life has grown. So guess what? Faith has got to grow too. It can't be stagnant. Not only can it grow, well, it must grow. That's what 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3 says. We ought to always... We might, we ought, ought, try this again. I can't do the ought always very well. We ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, and rightly so, because your faith is growing more and more, and the love of, the love of all you have for one another is increasing. Faith has to grow. If it doesn't grow, then you know what? It doesn't become much of a shield. You're going off to fight Satan and you've got like maybe a Pepsi-Cola pop top standing up in front of you and that doesn't stop anything. Maybe your faith is just like a little top of a tin can and it just, it's just not there anymore. You want a nice, big, great shield to put out there in front of you because they're going to come. The trials and tribulations are going to come. Satan's there waiting for you. He's going to put you to the test. And he's going to keep going and he's going to keep shooting until either he runs out of arrows because time has ended or until he destroys you. And he's not going to quit because that's his job. That's his mission. Kill, still, and destroy. So the last question I want to ask you is, is does your shield pack a punch? Does your shield scare the enemy? When Satan looks up there and he draws back that bow with that arrow, does he kind of have to sit there and stand for a break? Is he afraid? You know, James tells us that Satan should fear us. It says, submit yourself then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. When Satan looks at our shield and he sees it out there, he should be saying, this is a jolly waste of time for me because there is no crack, no crevice. And even where they are a little bit weak, they've got this great big shield of faith where they put all of it in with God to say, okay, God, whatever I don't have, I'm just going to put my faith out there in front of it, and that's what I'm going to let Satan shoot at. And Satan should just be afraid of that. In fact, he should learn from it. But I think oftentimes Satan sits there and, well, he has a little bit of confidence. He's there and he just confidently hurls those arrows at us over and over and over. Because he's not afraid of it. So here's what I want to ask you something. The armor is now complete. I want you to take a look at George. 
I noticed this. Now, for those who don't know, George spent about a month and a half laying back here in this little back room because he had to be built and I put him there. But, but after I had George laying back there on the floor and I had laid all the armor on him, I noticed something really unique about this. When I started this sermon series and I started talking about George, who did you see? You saw George. Take a look now. How much of George do you see? Not a whole lot, do you? What is now the focus of George's life? It's the armor he's standing behind. Little by little, pieces of his life have been covered, and so now he is equipped to go out and commit. He is equipped to go out and fight the battle that he was meant to fight. And so I want to close today and close this sermon series by asking the question, how about you? Have you made this level of commitment in your life? Have you taken up the helmet of salvation? Have you put on the breastplate of righteousness? Have you allowed truth to wrap around your life? Have you allowed God's word to become strong in your life? Have you laced up those boots and now you're ready to go on a mission? Have you been on your knees praying? Do you understand what it is you're up against? George has got his armor on and he is ready for a battle. Are you? Or are you still sitting there just studying the pieces and trying to wonder, do I really want to get in this thing? I mean, this sounds hard work. Tell you what, right now, if you could have a conversation with Brandon, he'd probably tell you exactly how much hard work battle is. Because you get up early, and you go to bed late, and you're working the entire day through. He could probably give us testimony. But here's the deal. If you're going to stand up for something, there's going to be some battles in your life, and you're going to have to be equipped to commit. You're going to need every single piece of this armor, so let me encourage you. Be ready for your battles. Go ahead and start now putting on the armor of God. Don't wait. Don't wait until the enemy's upon you and you're scamping around, taking inventory and trying to figure out how. Go ahead. Accept what God's given you. Prepare yourself. And then we're going to march out and try to make a difference in this world. There will be a time of invitation. And